try hard enough that car noise almost sounds like a river when the flute's playing. <laughs> Well, um, my wife and I uh, moved to Charleston. Uh, we moved down here, um, I guess, about nine years ago. We've been living in downtown Charleston, and we love it. Really friendly place to be. Um, but before then, we lived up in the mountains of uh, Boone, North Carolina. And before that, I came from uh, Kansas. I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up on a farm and ranch there, and I um, went to school at the University of Oklahoma. And, I've had a unique opportunity to travel all around the country and in other countries uh, and spend time with um, people who know ancient things, stories, music, how to craft instruments uh, from natural materials. This is a traditional southeastern style flute made from um, river cane grass. Uh, any tribes that would have lived here in the south might have made such an instrument. but. Several years ago, almost a decade now, maybe it was a decade, um, I was part of a band called Sapien, as in Homo sapiens. Homo first, sapien to be wise, our species. And we were invited by the cultural um, attaché of the country of South Africa to come and share our music at several festivals and museums and folk clubs. And our music was a little different. Uh, we, we called it whole world music, it blended uh, Australian didgeridoos, African, Middle Eastern, and Latin style percussion. We had guitar, cello, uh, Native American flute, Native American drums and rattles, and we'd kind of blend all this music together with some storytelling in between um, as a demonstration that, look, if all these instruments from all these different places can get along and sound good together, and they don't even have brains, why can't we? And that's, that was just the basic message. And you think, oh, that's, that's a little simplistic. But uh, the story I'm going to share with you I call How Music and a One-Eyed Zulu Angel Saved Me. So we went to South Africa, and we got there into the city of Johannesburg. At that time, and still today, is the number one murder capital in the world. And if... If, if it seems like, well, maybe it's not like that everywhere there, it, it felt scary any time we were in Johannesburg. Driving in the, the vans, the combis, they call them little combis, like little VW vans, and we'd be driving around. But we got to go to these different festivals. The first night we were there, uh, we stayed on the outskirts of town with huge iron gates, everything barricaded, barbed wire around the whole perimeter uh, with a family who had helped... Um, bring about the end of apartheid by uh, ho allowing leaders of the anti-apartheid movement to meet in the basement of their home. And this was a white couple. They were of English descent. And had they been caught by the government at that time, they would have been executed. That was treasonous for them to have, to have tried to help end apartheid. And that was kind of what they had done. And so this was the family that had offered to put us up for the first few days so we could find a guitarist from South Africa and somebody who, um, you know, some, a couple of the musicians who would travel with us. It was myself and three friends. And so we spent the first night there on their property. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to sleep outside. I'm not sleeping inside of a house my first night in Africa. I want to sleep on the ground. Um, and my friends thought I was crazy. And the people at the house, they said, you'll be fine. You're fine. So laid down, put my sleeping bag out, we brought our sleeping bag. We knew we'd be camping out a lot, even if we were staying in houses, because a lot of the houses we stayed in, if they had a roof on them, it was leaking. This one was fine, it was nice, but we ended up staying in a lot of rough places. But, but I was out there, and after about an hour, here comes one of my friends in the group, Snowbear, to join me, and then another one of my friends. Pretty soon we're all four out there. They're like, yeah, we got to sleep outside our first night in Africa. We're, we're, we're naturalists, we lead hikes, we've camped out a lot. This is what we got to do. Well, a little past midnight, we all bolt up, right, in our sleeping bags, clutching our hearts, hearing the guttural roar of lions. Now, we're right outside the city of Johannesburg. Come on, there can't be, but it was, it had to be. There's nothing else. And they were literally right outside the fence. Terrified us. And we all, our stuff jumped up and ran back inside. We wake up in the morning, and uh, the owner there, Mark, uh, he tells us, he said, oh, that was fine, that's a lion park. They're all inside a gated enclosure. That's five miles away. 
five miles away, and that sound literally sounded like it was so out here on that street. It was that close. It was that loud, that sound. So that was a good introduction that there might be some dangerous things in South Africa. So we would go to the festivals and we would perform, and I had decided, and it was a good idea, I decided to bring along a bunch of my flutes that I make as trade items and as gift items, and, and to sell if I needed extra cash. But I also decided to bring along some flute blanks, and maybe we could make some instruments there. Now, in those days, you could take stuff with you on the airplanes. I could take my knives and my files. I didn't try to take the propane tank torches with me to heat up the hot tools, but I said, maybe we can find that there. And, and we did. And I did a couple workshops where musicians from many different countries, but a lot of people from different places in Africa came and made flutes with me. And they just, they loved it. Because many of the flutes in Africa are very quiet. You, you can hear them if it's the only instrument playing, but these flutes can be played pretty loud. The sound will carry with drums and flutes and other things going, and that's why they loved them. They said, we can play these. Uh, there was a group from Ghana that took them and uh, back home, and they are still today playing these flutes with them. Um, they refer to the Native Americans as the black red man. That was how they, they'd say, the Native American, they say, oh, you mean the black red man. That's how they would refer to, to Native Americans. Well. We were at this one festival and we were invited to come out to a village and watch a naming ceremony. And the person who invited us was the personal attendant of the chief. And he said, first of all, if nudity in any way offends you, you don't want to come. Because we do our dances the way we used to do our dances, not the way maybe you would be accustomed to. And if you're going to be offended and tell us how improper we are, don't come. And we went, and we got there, and it was National Geographic. I mean, we were just right there, front row, and it was like, my goodness. And after about five minutes, it was just kind of like, my goodness, this just doesn't seem like such a big deal. But the first five minutes, it was like, wow. You know, and then it was just like, okay, you know, because you know, three, four hundred people dancing and partially nude or semi-nude, you know, first big deal. But So we were having experiences like this. And... We left one of the festivals, and we're driving through a very kind of, looks like a no man's land in between one place and the next. We're heading towards Durban near the coast, and this little van breaks down. And we had two, um, two gentlemen of South African descent, uh, both of English descent, who'd been, who'd been willing to drive us around free of charge just to go around. All we had to pay for was the gas, and we would feed them. So anywhere we went, we bought their food which was quite generous. They had set up all the bookings for us because they believed in our message. They thought it would be very healing to the people of South Africa to hear our message. We're driving down the road and the van breaks down and these two guys say, look, we're miles from anywhere. No one's gonna come along. We're gonna walk and go get help. And I don't know why we all thought it was a good idea for the two guys who lived in this country to leave and go, but they did leaving four completely clueless Americans there. Well, my big friend Snowbear, he's our percussionist, and he plays the flute also. Well, I'm kind of sleepy. I think I'm going to take me a little nap. He climbs in the van, tries to stretch out. He never could. He, he came home kind of like this at the end of the trip because he never could quite stretch out. And so he takes a nap, and our, our friend Fuzz, he's an ornithologist, and he's like, I'm going to get my binoculars. I'm heading off for that little area over there. I'm going to look for some birds. Boom, he's gone. That leaves myself, myself and uh, my friend Frank. And Frank proceeds to take out his pocket knife and clean his fingernails. Big old knife, starts cleaning his fingernails. And I'm just kind of sitting there, I think I'm reading a book, an Alan Patton book probably, about South Africa. And all of a sudden we see, way out there, we could tell there was some sort of little village, some sort of little place. And we see some people coming towards us. Frank and I are just kind of looking, and uh, we notice right away there might be a problem because um, they're kind of moving like this. And as they get closer, we can see they're holding big, big bottles, and they're kind of stumbling. And we can see their clothes. There's just holes on them. They're just filthy, tattered. Their hair is a mess stuff stuck in it, grass, and, and I'm like, this is not good. Because we're probably on their land, 
And here we are, four white people, seven years after apartheid ended, and these guys are obviously intoxicated. And they got closer and closer, and they get right up on us, and one of the guys, in a very belligerent, angry tone, shoves his finger right in Frank's face. Frank is still cleaning his fingers with that knife, and he says, that looks like a very sharp knife. Frank's like, it is. Now Frank's from Alabama, he doesn't scare easily. He just keeps going, and the guy says, let me see it. And I don't know why, or what possessed Frank, he turns it around and Boy Scout Manor points the handle towards the guy, and the guy jerks it out of his hand. Luckily, Frank's holding it the right way, the blade away from you so it won't cut you. If, if he'd been holding it with the blade towards him, it would have sliced his thumb. The guy takes it and comes right up to Frank's neck. This knife is sharp enough. I got you like a pig, you white. And he just starts in on us. And the other three guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm looking in the truck. There's Snow Bear. There's Buzz. And there we are. I reach in the van and I pull out a little mini micro cassette recorder. And everywhere we went, much to the chagrin of some of the adults in the groups, everywhere we went, when we would see groups of people, I would, especially children, I would just walk up to them and I would say, Hey, I'm from America. I work with kids and I do stories and music. Do you have any songs you'd like to share with the kids in America? And uh, one special place we were at a, um, um, a park where supposedly one of the earliest ancestors of human beings was ever found, the remains. And this group of kids just, they're having lunch. They're right in the middle of lunch. And all of a sudden, 200 kids are surrounding me and I'm holding my cassette recorder up singing. And all the teachers gather around. Everybody's singing and clapping. And then one of the teachers said, could we do some more after we finish our lunch, please? I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't have any expectation that they would all get up and join me. I just thought the kids at this one table. So I've been gathering music and songs and stories when I could. I, I met some wonderful poets who shared some poetry and got to go on stage and play my flute while they would do their poetry. And so I reach in and grab this micro cassette recorder and go right up to this head guy who's got the knife couple inches away from my friends though just back and forth and I say hey do you guys know any songs you want to share I'm from America and I work with kids and, and um, maybe you guys have some songs you could sing us this guy just looks at me turns the knife back around Boy Scout style hands it to Frank and said we are musicians we are, we are a band we are, we are quite good I said we're musicians too and I pull out one of my flutes and I, I play a little bit Ah, well, yes, we, we will sing for you, but we, we're not ready, we're not. Do you have some water we can clean up with? And I said, sure. Do you have a brush? We need to clean our hair. And, you know, all of a sudden we're giving them toothbrushes, toothpaste, brushes, and they go over and start tucking in their shirts, getting themselves ready. And, and this takes about 10, 15 minutes. They've put the, the whole demeanor has changed. This, this violent situation, or the verge of violence, now they're, they're going to perform for us. And they get in a little half circle. Is anybody here familiar with the music of a group called Lady Smith Black Mombasa? This was their village. This was their village. Lady Smith, anybody here familiar with the music of Paul Simon from the 1980s, Graceland? That's Lady Smith Black Mombasa. This was their village. These guys were all nephews and cousins to all of the people in that band. And that's the style they sang in. And these guys made a little half circle and they began to sing. Snow Bear woke up and I looked around and Frank has tears streaming down his face. I have tears. Snow Bear is just mouth agape. Fuzz heard the singing, comes running across. And it was unbelievably beautiful. I wish I had had a better recording device. He's going to sing two or three songs for us. And then we show them what we do. We pull out one of our drums and the ditch you're doing the flute and we start playing a little bit. All of a sudden, I'm like, are you guys hungry? I'm like, well, actually, we are hungry. Our van broke down. Just a second. Two of them take off. They come back. Some women are coming with them. They're bringing us food. They're bringing us something to drink. We're sitting around. Finally, our friends get back. They've got the part for the van. We get it fixed. 
We're leaving. We're hugging each other. Goodbye. So nice to meet you. Take care. If you ever come back, come stay in our village. And we leave. Now, I'm fully convinced that situation with those guys was only going to go downhill had something not intervened. And in that particular case, as I have found so often, so very often, music and stories, sharing of yourself personally, saved the day. It stopped that. Well, we had some other experiences. We were there for a couple more weeks, and then Frank and Snow Bear had to get back home, and Fuzz and I decided to stay one extra week. Now, I wanted to go down and spend a couple days in, a, in the Zulu village where we had gone to the naming ceremony. The cultural attaché had invited me, and Fuzz was like, there's no way I'm going to go stay in that village. The village where we had gone to, to perform and to watch the people um, do the naming ceremonies was called Etumba Village, the village of a thousand hills. And during apartheid, it was known as the village of a thousand deaths. It was where people who were considered betrayers to the anti-apartheid cause were brought. And very graphically, tires were filled with gasoline put over their head and they were set ablaze. And over a thousand people were killed in this village like that. When we first went there, we didn't know that. We saw no kind of semblance of any kind of violence like that at all. We were only meeted with, greeted with love, respect, courtesy. It was just amazing. And I had been invited, and I said, well, I'm going to go back down there. I was like, there's no way I'm going to that village. Well, I went, and I had a very positive experience. I got there on the day when the family who was hosting me, next door neighbor, had died. And they were very apologetic. They said, all of the fun things we had planned for you, we can't do. We're going to have a wake tonight, and then tomorrow we have to dig the grave and help bury her. You wouldn't want to be part of that, would you? And I said, if I'm welcome. Because to me, if you attend, a, a, if you go to, into a different culture and you attend a funeral, a wedding, or you're there for a birth ceremony, that's how you really get to know people. You get to see their true customs as they have kept them. And I thought, this is amazing. Well, I did get to go to the wake, and it was in a room about half this size, and in one corner there was a sheet across the room, and the body was behind that. And in the rest of the room were little benches, and everyone was sitting like this. It must have been everyone in the village was there. And at the front was one bench with the minister or preacher or priest from each denomination sitting there in a row. And so everybody would be up and singing and clapping, and then everyone would sit down. And then one of these preachers, whoever, I don't know how they figured out turns. It just seemed random to me, but there must have been turns. Somebody would jump up and they would start talking and preaching. And all of a sudden, as soon as anyone in the audience would stand up and start wailing, everyone else in the audience would stand up and start clapping and singing until that person was relaxed enough to sit back down. Their mourning had stopped. And then everyone would sit down. And then the next person would stand up and talk. Now, the Catholic priest got very mad because he had barely gotten started when somebody stood up and everybody started singing. His turn was done. And you could tell he was mad. And he looked at me as if I was to blame. He just stared at me, and I'm like, I didn't stand up. But that was the interesting thing. And I have felt this before when I've gone uh, and spent time among the Navajo or the Macaw tribe um, in Washington State. Most of the people are very friendly, kind, respectful, courteous, and caring towards me. Some people could care less that I'm there. And there's a small percentage, about 5%, who, who can't stand me for one thing. My skin color. Well, that's racism. That's discrimination. It's true across all cultures. And I felt that in this village. Well, so we, I had some amazing experiences like that. But the, the trip to South Africa has come to an end. Frank and Snowbear have left. Frank, when they went to the airport, left in the murder capital of the world, third highest crime rate in the world. All of his gear in his bags, including his passport, his wallet, and everything, sitting there while he turned at the counter and talked to them about his plane ticket. And he turned around and it was all gone. He barely got out of the country. So that's what their experience leaving the country was. Well, our experience, Fuzz and I, the van broke down. 
And the other guy who had been helping us forgot to come and pick us up when he heard the van was broken down. So there we were stranded about 150, 175 miles from Johannesburg to get back. And what are we going to do? Well, we tried making signs. Of, we'll hitchhike. We'll do it the good old-fashioned way. And everyone came up and said, no one will pick you up. You will kill them. They know that. No one will pick you up. I'm like, what? And they said, oh, yeah, if you pick someone up, they will kill you. They're not going to pick you up. And I'm like, okay. Um, we'll try to get a bus. So we would go in. And they're like, oh, you have to reserve bus tickets two days in advance. The only thing you can do is wait till the bus shows up and beg them or bribe them. So we got there, and the bus driver's like, I'm sorry, we're full. We've got two people, we've got two empty seats, and two people have bought tickets to come. He goes, I guess if they don't come, you can get on. And, and he says, we leave on time. And we were there, and all of a sudden he said, they're not here, get on the bus. He didn't even charge us. He just said, get on the bus. They've already paid for their tickets. We're like, oh, this is good. So we get on the bus, and we take this drive. We get into Johannesburg. It is well past midnight. And we pull in. There is no one else in the unloading station of the bus station. We are the only two white people on this bus. We're the only two non-South African people on this bus. And we are looking around, and we have drums and bags and all of our stuff. And we're looking around like, oh my God, oh my God, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And all of a sudden, a bald-headed man with one eye comes up and says, Hello, I am Zulu. Put your things on. I take care of you. Oh, you work for the bus station? I am Zulu. Put your things on the car. That would take care of you. And he takes us in, and we get into the bus station, and it was nice, and it was clean. And I said, wow, you can tell we're not in America. You know? <laughs> Ooh, you want to talk scary, go to the L.A. bus station. So he takes us through the whole bus station, and we come out the back. And we start heading down this alley, and Fuzz and I are like, this is great. This guy's taking care of us, you know? Oh, forgot to mention, we get into Johannesburg. The family that had hosted us at the beginning, they were going to come and pick us up. We called and called and called. They never picked up the phone. So that's why we ended up going with this guy, because our plans had changed. Well, we head out this back alley, and then we see people shooting up drugs. People against the wall having sex. People fighting, kicking each other. People drinking this is the alley he's taking us down. And we get about 10 steps down it, and at the, right at the same time I'm thinking this, Fuzz is thinking this, oh my God, they're gonna mug us. They're gonna mug us and take all of our stuff. And I looked at Fuzz and I'm ready to say, let's just grab a bag and run. We'll go back into the bus station. And right as I'm about to say it, Zulu turns around and says, no, no, trust me. You will be fine. They can't even see you. And we walk right through this crowd of people. He is weaving. We walk. No one talks to us. No one bothers us. No one even... It literally was as if no one noticed us. It was bizarre. We get through and there's this huge iron gate. And behind it's a little micro hotel. He buzzes it. They look in the camera. They see him. They open it and they let us in. We get up there. Behind the counter is a very, 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 very angry South African woman. She says, you cannot stay here. You are white. Get out. I do not let white people stay here. I hate white people. You people killed. We said, well, we're not from here. We're Americans. I hate you even more. You know, and we're like, oh, God. And Zulu just reaches over across the counter and whispers in her ear. And she says, Okay. Gives us keys, takes us down the hall, lets us in to a room literally about two by five with bug beds and that was it in it. You, you, could, you had to go sideways and you had to barely get on there. So, get in there, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, go back into the bus station. We want to thank Zulu. We hadn't been able to go. We wanted to go to the ATM and give him a tip. We didn't have any money. She had taken her credit card. We, she wouldn't go over that so we could give him a tip. We're going to go find him. He works in the bus station. 
we start asking everyone, we ask supervisors, everyone, there's nobody like that who works here. We don't even have people on duty at night. Yeah, but this, you know this guy, he has one eye. He's bald. His name is Zulu. There's no one like that here. We go back to the lobby. That woman's not there. They, I, I described the guy. They said, we've never seen or heard of anyone like that. So Fuzz and I just looked at each other and said, wow. Saved by music and a one-eyed Zulu angel. That's the end of my story. Thank you.